Well, good morning, church. During Advent this year, we're giving special attention to one of the more important but often overlooked aspects of the Christmas story, and that is the role of the prophecies concerning the coming of Israel's Messiah. Each Sunday in Advent, we're looking at different sets of prophecies that foretold the coming of the Messiah. And today, we're focusing on prophecies that are connected to one of the places that is of special note in the Christmas story, Bethlehem the village where Jesus was born. One comes from the prophet Isaiah, and one from his contemporary, the prophet Micah. In each of them, there's a surprising element that raises some questions. Let's take the second one first. So far this morning, we've heard the famous passage from the prophet Micah predicting the birth of the Messiah in Bethlehem three different times. It was the passage we opened with when we lit the second of the Advent candles, the Bethlehem candle. We read it again just a moment ago, and it was then quoted by Matthew in his gospel when he recounted the story of the coming of the Magi to visit the newly born king of the Jews. And though we did not read Luke's account of the birth of Jesus, the opening verses of Luke 2 remind us that he also mentions the importance of Bethlehem in the story. For it is to Bethlehem that Joseph and Mary must journey in order to be registered for Augustus Caesar's census because Joseph is from the line of David, and Bethlehem is David's ancestral home. Well, the first thing we should note about Micah's prophecy is that when King Herod hears about the birth of one who is called the King of the Jews, he has to inquire of the Jewish scholars about his birthplace. Part of the reason for that is that Herod was no student of the Scriptures. He was clever, he was politically savvy, and he was ruthless but he didn't know his Bible. But part of the reason he has to inquire about the birthplace of the Messiah is that it wasn't common knowledge. Those who studied the scriptures, the priests and the teachers, would have been aware of the prophecy from Micah. But even among this group, there would have been disputes about its meaning. For instance, did the mention of Bethlehem signal the actual birthplace of the Messiah, or did it simply indicate his lineage? So why is this obscure prophecy about the relatively unimportant little town of Bethlehem so important, so significant. Similarly, the prophecy from Isaiah leaves us with a question. Isaiah speaks of one to come, a branch on whom the Spirit of God will rest, an indication that this one who is to come is uniquely endowed with the Holy Spirit. His rule will realize the perfection of peace and put an end to the injustice and wickedness that is so prevalent in the world. Even those nations that are currently hostile to God and His people, who worship idols and who do not know the Lord, will come and submit to His governance or be judged by Him and destroyed. Yet, twice in this prophetic declaration, Isaiah refers to the coming one in connection with his lineage. He's a shoot that springs from the stump of Jesse, a branch that grows out of the root of Jesse. The mention of Jesse, twice in a short passage, without any preparation for it in the context, is striking. Why should the prophet mention the otherwise completely obscure shepherd rather than his more famous son, the king of Israel? The question about Bethlehem and the question about Jesse are related. For answers, we're going to have to dive into more of the history of Israel, beginning with another prophecy, one from the time of the patriarchs, the fathers of the nation of Israel, from the book of Genesis, chapter 49. Genesis 49 takes us back to the mid-19th century B.C., somewhere near the year 1850 B.C. Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, has 12 sons. They and their families have relocated from Canaan to Egypt because of a famine. Joseph, the 11th son, has become powerful as the vice-regent of Egypt. He's second only to Pharaoh in power. And he has provided for his family, who now number about 70, and they live in the land of Goshen. But Jacob is dying. As the heir to the promise given to Abraham, he knows that his family has a destiny, and it isn't in Egypt. They are the ones to whom God has promised the land of Canaan where they are to live in covenant with the only true God 
who will bless all the peoples of the earth through them, through this family. God will give the knowledge of himself, will bring a son who will rule over the nations and end the problem of human sinfulness. So before he dies... Jacob pronounces prophetic blessings on each of his sons and their families. Now, in biblical culture, this act by a father of pronouncing a final blessing was considered part of the inheritance granted to his children. And the blessing was not just a wish, it was a prophetic announcement of what the father was praying that God would grant to them. Each of these 12 families will become a tribe within the people who will be known by Jacob's new name, Israel the name given to him by God when Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord. And Genesis 49 contains these blessings for each of these future tribes of Israel. Now the prophecy, prophecy from Genesis 49 that is of particular significance to us this morning is the one that's pronounced over Judah, the fourth son of Jacob, and especially verse 10. Verse 10 says, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Now, why is this verse so important? There's two reasons. The first reason is that Judah is the fourth son, not the first son. Normally in the ancient world, the inheritance of titles and status and authority over the extended family falls to the eldest son. But in Jacob's own case, with the help of his mother, he had managed to game the system and win from his older brother Esau both the privilege of being in line of the promise given to Abraham and the honor of his father's blessing. Now, for his part, his older brother Esau had demonstrated his lack of spiritual concern for the things of God by trading his birthright, that right to be in the line for the promise of God, traded it all for a meal. And Jacob has now had plenty of years to think about what it meant to carry on his grandfather's faith, to be the one through whom God would bring his blessing to the world, and to think about the significance of what Esau had done by despising that relationship with God. So when Jacob's three oldest sons revealed their own true character, their actions did not go unnoticed by their father, Jacob. Reuben, the firstborn, violated his father's trust, humiliated him by having sex with Jacob's concubine, his brother's mother. Simeon and Levi, sons two and three, slaughtered an entire village to avenge the rape of their sister. And their violent attack put Jacob and all of the family at risk, endangering them while they were still only a small group in an unfriendly land. Consequently, before his death, Jacob passes over his first three sons. He does pronounce blessing on them, but he passes over them and pronounces upon Judah the blessing that comes with being in line from Abraham. The promise that the rulership of Israel, the people of Yahweh, and the nations, the rulership over those nations that will come, not, they're going to come not through the line of the firstborn son of Jacob, but through his fourth son, Judah. Now the second reason why this prophecy in Genesis 49, 10 is so significant, for that answer we have to go forward in time about eight centuries to the time of the judges, around the year 1050 B.C., to the story of Saul, the first king of Israel. By 1050, the 12 tribes of Israel have been living in the Promised Land for at least 200 years, possibly as many as 400 years, but they have no king. Instead, God has raised up and empowered local chieftains and prophets for them who have served as judges, his spokespersons, to remind the people that God ruled over them. And they have governed God's people as his representatives. They've delivered them from those who attacked them. But the increasing attacks from the surrounding nations have precipitated a crisis. The people are now demanding that God give them a king who will fight their enemies, who will lead an army to defeat those who continually plunder their harvests and force them into servitude. And their demands provoke God, who tells Samuel, who is the last of these prophet judges who govern in God's name, God tells Samuel, they have not rejected you, but me. 
And so God tells Samuel to anoint Saul as their first king. You can read all about this in 1 Samuel chapters 8, 9, and 10. Well, as it turns out, Saul is a great military leader. He brings Israel some victories against the Philistines, who are their primary enemy, and against some of the other surrounding nations. But he has a seriously fatal character flaw, namely that he does not follow through with what God commands him to do. And Saul's failure to obey God ultimately results in God's rejection of him as king. And so God tells Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. So I can hear you thinking, okay, well, I see that this is getting us to Jesse in Bethlehem and starting to sound a little familiar, but what does this have to do with the prophecy of Genesis 49? It has everything to do, actually. You see, in the story of Saul's rise to kingship over Israel, which we read in 1 Samuel 8 to 13, there are two points that are crucial for understanding the significance of Saul. And the first is that Saul was descended from Benjamin, not from Judah. And the second is that the people of Israel, who demanded of Samuel that God give them a king, they effectually forced God's hand. They weren't satisfied knowing that God was their true king. They wanted a military leader, someone to head up their armies, someone they could look at and know, that's our guy, that's our hero, he's our king. And they insisted that God give them a king. And God let them have their way. And what they got was a king whom God never intended for them to have. He wasn't the one whom God had chosen. He wasn't the one for whom the scepter had been promised, the one from Judah's descendant. That one wasn't ready yet. And what the Israelites didn't know was that God had been preparing a king for them all along. And he'd indicated so 800 years earlier in Jacob's prophecy of the scepter coming through Judah. And he had been actively preparing for this one's arrival for four generations. How do we know that? For that answer, we have to turn to the book of Ruth. Because the events of the book of Ruth take place roughly a century before the time of Saul. And the story begins with a significant detail and a cruel irony. The detail is this. A man named Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their two sons are Ephrathites of Bethlehem. That is, they are a part of a clan known as Ephrathah who live in the region known by their clan name and that region surrounds the town of Bethlehem in the land that's been allotted to the tribe of Judah. Now the cruel irony is this. The name of that town, the word Bethlehem, means house of bread or house of food. But there's a famine in the land. There's a famine in the house of bread. So Elimelech and his family have to leave their ancestral home to find food in the land of Moab. They have to go east of the Jordan River to live among the people who tried to prevent Israel from entering Canaan after their deliverance from Egypt. So the family settles in Moab. Unfortunately, Elimelech dies. The two sons take Moabite wives for themselves. They live there for about 10 years, and then they also die. And Naomi decides to return to Bethlehem because she's heard there's news. Once again, there's food in the land of Judah. And Ruth, who is one of her daughters-in-law, insists on staying with Naomi in order to care for her. And Ruth's choice to leave her home, to leave Moab, to accompany Naomi, signals her decision to identify with Naomi's God and with Naomi's people. To, to identify with Yahweh instead of the Moabite gods, and to identify with the clan of Ephratah instead of with the Moabites. So when the two of them return to Bethlehem, Ruth is able to find a way to sustain themselves. She goes to the fields of a relative of her father-in-law during harvest. And there, 
She's allowed to glean in the fields after the servants have harvested the crops. She gathers up the leftover grain that falls to the ground so that she and Naomi can have something to eat. And that relative who owns the field is named Boaz. And Boaz notices her devotion to her mother-in-law. Eventually, he takes Ruth as his wife, and in doing so, takes his place in the lineage of God's chosen king. Boaz, a descendant of Perez, the son of Judah, has a son by Ruth. That son is named Obed. Obed has a son. That son is Jesse, the shepherd of Bethlehem. And Jesse is the father of David, the son whom God chose to replace Saul, the shepherd whom God intended all along to be Israel's king. Elimelech the Ephrathite was not himself an ancestor of David, but his life and his family's connection to Bethlehem are critical parts of the untold story behind the prophecies of both Isaiah and Micah. Without Elimelech and his family going to Moab, we don't have Ruth. Without Naomi, Elimelech's widow, and Ruth herself, also a widow, without them returning to Bethlehem, we don't have a continuation of the line that leads to David. Without Ruth, Boaz has no heir. And without Boaz, Ruth has no significance. Because Ruth returned with her widowed mother-in-law to the town of Bethlehem, she met and married Boaz and continued his line for three more generations and on past that. Her son was the grandfather of Jesse, who was the father of David, who became the king of Israel, and Bethlehem, the ancestral home of Jesse and the Ephrathite clan, becomes known as the city of David. It was the place where God saved a family from famine and provided for the continuation of the line of Judah that eventuated in God's chosen King David in fulfillment of Jacob's prophecy 800 years earlier. So Isaiah's prophecy mentions Jesse, and Micah's prophecy mentions Bethlehem, the ancestral home of the Ephrathites. Isaiah's mention of Jesse recalls his connection with Bethlehem to the tribal identity of his clan and reminds us of the connection between the prophecy of Jacob in Genesis and the fulfillment in the person of David, the son of Jesse. Micah's reference to Bethlehem recalls its significance as the home of Israel's greatest king through whom God fulfilled his promise to give Israel a king from the tribe of Judah. And hold on a minute. Both Isaiah and Micah are prophesying in the 8th century B.C., 200 years after David's death. So the point of their prophecies cannot simply be to remind Israel about their former king. Each of them, Isaiah and Micah, speaks of one who is yet to come. And each of them is prophesying to the nation of Judah, warning the people of the impending onslaught that awaits them if they do not repent. The Assyrians are already threatening the northern kingdom. Within a few short years, they will overwhelm the northern capital of Samaria and they'll take the nation of Israel into captivity in Assyria. And because those in Judah, the southern kingdom, did not learn from the lesson of their northern kin, the same sad story is repeated a century and a half later when the Babylonians invade, destroy the city of Jerusalem and the temple and take Judah into captivity in exile in Babylonia. That second invasion by Babylon devastated the nation who thought that God would protect them, they'd protect his temple because, well, they were God's people in spite of their flagrant idolatry and their blatant immorality and their rampant injustice, they thought, oh, but sure, God's not going to do, he wouldn't destroy us. And their land, which was given to them by God, well, it surely wouldn't be taken away from them by those who didn't believe in, in Yahweh. But it was. And not only were they thrust from the land and forced to live in servitude in a foreign land, the royal line of David was broken. The last descendant of David to sit on his throne as the king of Judah, Zedekiah, was forced to watch as the Babylonians executed his sons in front of him right before they gouged out his eyes. Both Micah and Isaiah predicted this judgment of God on the nation. 
But both of them also spoke of a remnant which would be saved. And Isaiah in particular, in chapters 6 through 10, has warned Judah that only a remnant would remain. The majority of the people would suffer the judgment of God's wrath, but those who believed would be rescued and returned to the land. Both Micah and Isaiah also spoke of the one who was to come after the judgment. And Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 11 continues to use this picture of a remnant, a stump of a tree that's been cut down. But now he turns from using the picture of a stump to symbolize the few who would be saved to using the picture to symbolize the one who's going to come, the king who would reign justly, the ruler over Israel who would come from the stump of Jesse, from the little town of Bethlehem. And his rule would be universal. All the nations would bow before him. For he would rule not only over the descendants of Abraham, but over all of those to whom the blessing of Abraham had been extended. The people who would know their God through the light that shone in the darkness. There would come a branch from the stump of a tree that had been cut down, removed from its place, and left for dead. And that branch, from the root of Jesse, In the line of David, from the tribe of Judah, connected to the ancestral home in Bethlehem, that branch would rule in righteousness and faithfulness over the people of God, over Israel, and over all the nations who would come to worship Israel's God because of him. That word for branch in Isaiah 11.1 is, in Hebrew, netzer. It's a word that Matthew will reference in a word play to show that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy from Isaiah He was a Netzer because he grew up in Nazareth and was known as a Nazarene. This branch would not simply be an ordinary man. Now his origins, as Micah tells us, are from of old, which is a poetic way of saying that his ancestry begins before history, before time even. He comes from eternity past. This branch will not only be connected to the line of Jesse and King David, he will be uniquely anointed by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God will rest on him, not temporarily as he did on the prophets, but permanently, inherently, and completely. The references in Micah to Bethlehem and in Isaiah to Jesse thus are pointing not to the coming of David as the promised king to the nation of Israel, they're reminding them of that, but pointing beyond David to the son who was promised to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the heir who would rule as king over God's people forever. The prophecies are pointing to the one who would be born in Bethlehem, who would be descended from Jesse, and thus be fully human and rightfully heir to David's throne, but whose origins are in eternity, who is eternally and fully God and the rightful Lord of the universe. Eight centuries from Jacob's prophecy of the scepter of Judah's rulership to the fulfillment in David, the shepherd from Bethlehem, the son of Jesse, descended from Judah through Boaz and Ruth. Eight centuries from the prophecies of Micah and Isaiah referencing Jesse and Bethlehem and the promises that were fulfilled in David to the birth of the one they foretold, the son of David the branch from the root of Jesse, who would rule over all the world with righteousness and faithfulness, who would bring in the peace that we have lacked since Eden. And now, a little more than 20 centuries since his birth, 18 centuries or so since the church began celebrating that birth annually, we are here. And we are waiting for his return. For the promised fulfillment of the prophecy that he would reign over all the earth, and the completion of his messianic task to bring peace and righteousness to all the nations, to bring the blessing promised to Abraham to all the families of the world, to bring us all back to the Father. So if it seems like you've been waiting a long time to see what God has promised, remember Jacob and Judah, Bethlehem, and Jesse, Micah, and Isaiah, and don't forget Matthew. He has come to us. He has kept his promise. 
we have a king for us, born for us in Bethlehem in fulfillment of the promise that God made. We have the Messiah, the Lord. We have the fulfillment of the prophecies to strengthen our hearts as we wait in faith for the rest of the promise that God has made, the rest of the gift that is ours because of Christmas.